one day I was walking up my road from my house to my neighbor's house when a sheriff flew by me. He slammed on his brakes, he backed up, he put on the spotlight, and he said to me, hey you, where are you going? And I said, right there. He said, where are you coming from? I said, right there, are you looking for somebody? He said, no, you look very drunk to me. I said, excuse me. He said, you look very drunk to me. I said, no, I have cerebral palsy. He said, so what? And he took off. He assumed by seeing me walk that I had cerebral palsy. A lot of people assume when they see me walk or hear me talk that I am either, um, am either drunk I am in a retardation. But I am luckier than all of you because I can get a ticket for WWI, walking while intoxicated. <laughs> One of my minor goals in life is to go through a DWI roadblock. I'll refuse to take a breathalyzer and I'll end up in jail. <laughs> my husband said he would not bail me out. But perhaps one of you in the audience would be kind enough to bail me out in about three days. <laughs> Everybody's life is like a puzzle. Today I'm going to share with you the pieces of my puzzle. My puzzle was a bit more challenging to put together because I have cerebral palsy. But despite the cerebral palsy, I put the puzzles together because I'm a person first who happens to have a disability. Today, I'm going to let you walk in my shoes for about 10 minutes, because I want you to walk in the shoes of a person with a disability, so you can see what it feels like to have a disability. You don't get to keep my shoes, because they're mine, and they are worn in their scuff because they're the shoes of a 62-year-old woman who's a wife, a mother, a friend, a grandmother, and who happens to have cerebral palsy. I was born with cerebral palsy. When I was born, I was the youngest of four and the cutest. But nobody knew I had a disability. At about a year old, I was diagnosed with my first label which was mental retardation. At, at four and a half, they diagnosed me with cerebral palsy. At those times, children with disabilities weren't kept at home, and I was placed in a residential institution in Leroy, New York, where I learned to become a self-advocate and a brat. <laughs> I spent 10 months in the institution, and after being there about two weeks, my mission was to bust out. <laughs> and so I did everything in my power to do that. They said you had to wear a helmet. I hate helmets. There was no way I was going to wear this. When I said to the staff I didn't like it, they said, too bad. So I hit it, or I tried to break it. And one day I tried to flush it down the toilet. They said to me, okay, you don't have to wear this helmet anymore. More. So I learned really early that if I was stubborn and persistent, I could get anything I wanted, and it still works today. <laughs> While I was in the institution for 10 months, I put all my clothes on backwards every day. I put my shoes on the wrong feet. I threw all my food on the floor, and at night I would get up in the middle of the night and change all the kids' clothes. So in the morning they got the wrong clothes. Ten months after I entered, they threw me out. My mission was accomplished. I got thrown out of my first school when I was six. That's a treasure. That summer, my mom, who was my hero, went to bat for me. And she went down to the school district in Geneseo, New York, and said, my daughter's going to go to school. They said, nope, 
We don't allow kids with disabilities in our school. And my mother said, get ready, she's coming. <laughs> and I said, no, Mrs. Dudman. My mother said yes. And that summer, that September, I was the first child with a disability to ever go to school in Genesee, New York. <laughs> if, it wasn't, if it wasn't for my mom, I wouldn't be standing here today. School was really hard for me. They gave me no testing modification. Writing was difficult. At seven, I knew I was not normal, but I heard the word normal. And my dream and my vision for 20 years was to become normal. When you're normal, when you're seven, you have to learn to ride a bike. So I, my mom bought me bikes and band-aids because they went hand in hand. <laughs> and one, I, one summer day, I found the biggest hill in Geneseo, and I walked the bike up. It took me two and a half hours, turned around, came down, took me 10 minutes because I hear all the trees. I didn't see them going up, but I felt them coming down. <laughs> and I took on a bike that looked like this, no pedals and no tires, and I needed all the band-aids in the house. And that night, my mom said, oh, well. And the next day, she bought me more bikes, another bike and more band-aids. Three bikes later, and a million bucks of band-aids, I learned to ride a bike because I'm a person first who happens to have a disability. School is really, really difficult. Um, I, um, I didn't have any teachers who believed in me. When I got in seventh grade, I had the one and only teacher who ever believed in me. And one day she came to school and said, how would you like to come and bake cookies at my house? I said, this lady's crazy. She's never seen a person with cerebral palsy and flour in the same room. They don't. <laughs> so I went to her house and I made cookies and there was flour everywhere. And she didn't care because what she told me was all the cookies were the same. The mess didn't matter. You couldn't tell my cookie from her cookie. People with disabilities do things differently. But the end result is always the same. When I don't ski, I don't ski with poles because somebody will get killed, <laughs> you or me. But I go up the chairlift and down just like you, and I reach a bar. School was hard. I wasn't given time for testing. I took five regions, and I flunked all five, not because I didn't know it. I never had time to finish it. When I graduated from high school, I graduated in the bottom of my class. My mother believed in education, so I went on to college. The first college I went to gave me all my testing early. They recognized the disability. They recognized that I needed modification. At the end of my freshman year, I had a 3 I got, I got to be in religion. What did a Jewish girl know at a Baptist college? Nothing. <laughs> I then went on to Geneseo because I wanted to be a teacher. Geneseo would not give me a, a teaching degree. They said my speech was too poor. It would have a negative influence on parents and children, and children would be affected. I quit school. I was at the end of my rope. The next year, a couple of things happened. I got my license, because that was the next piece of the puzzle to feel normal. Again, a person first who had been up with disability, and I started dating. Next year, I went back to college, and I have a degree from Genesis State in sociology that qualifies you to do nothing. <laughs> But it looked good on the resume. Both these liked it. I said, OK, Tina, you have a college degree. You drive a car. You're still trying to be normal. So you better read Family Circle and get married. <laughs> so I married the first jackass that asked me. 
And I thought that was going to prove to the world I was normal. That doesn't prove anything but get in a whole lot of trouble. As an adult, I've had several jobs. The first job was I drove an ice cream truck because you need a sociology degree to drive an ice cream truck. <laughs> and then I applied at an agency called the Advocacy Center. And Sheila Appleby, who was the director there, was my hero. And she took a chance. And I was an advocate at the Advocacy Center. And I'm still an advocate at both of I stayed married 18 years, you know, because I thought I was supposed to. And I accepted what it is, is that I'm a person first who happens to have a disability. I can't define normal. So after 18 years, I said, okay, you're allowed to do one more normal thing. And I got divorced. <laughs> and that's my biggest treasure. 15 years ago, I got remarried for all the right reasons. I am the mother of three, the grandmother of three. I met my husband, Tom, when I was 43. The first time in my life I've ever had a best friend. Think about going through life and not having a best friend until you're 43 years old. He's given me love, he's given me friendship, and he's given me companionship. And because of Tom, because of my family, because of my work and everybody who believes in me, guess what happened when I was 50 years old? My puzzle finally came together. And I want to believe that Tom was a motivating factor in that, along with my children. And I want to leave you with one quote that I love that says, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. And I'd like to thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.